again music nice and relaxing i hope you're well i hope you're able to cope with what's going on in the world today thank you we must every morning right and say a prayer for all the courageous frontline workers those in healthcare, transit you know buses subways farm grocery the stores where we have to buy our food domestic and delivery workers I mean, where would we be without these delivery workers, right? They're putting their lives on the line to keep all of us healthy and happy. And you must always pray for them, all right? And think with gratitude, all right? So thank you for your financial support and for buying our videos. Today is Memoir Day. I know it looks backwards, okay? And for life. 1962 was a very special year. I know most of you weren't even born then. I became a member of the Robert Joffrey Ballet, which enabled me to go on eye-opening tours of the Near and Far East and Russia. And I met and worked with Alvin Ailey. Yes. So just to take you back a little bit, okay? So, you know, this is... Robert Joffrey. So he was stocky, he was short, right? Big leg, very energetic, um, completely different from the San Francisco Ballet. So that was one of the big changes for me. And also uh, the people that I met uh, in the Joffrey, we became like a family because actually we stayed together from 62, most of us, until 69 when by then we were the Harkness Ballet, all right? But uh, anyway, this was really, um, again, I say everything is life changing, um, but it was, was. And so, this is um, when I danced for Robert Joffrey at the Seattle World Fair um, uh, with Helgi Thomason, Vicente Nebrada, Jerry Arpino, Nels Jorgensen, and Francesca Corkle. All right. So, that was the first time I worked with Bob. And from there, he said, Come to New York. Join my company. I said, yes. Okay. So, because as you know, that was one of my goals to go to New York. I mean, to audition, I didn't know what. Anyway, this is also, again, thanks to Jamie DeBolt, who I met in Utah. And um, he had brought me into New York to do Flower Drum Song. And now here we are, two years later, and he was in the Joffrey Valley. He was working with Bob Joffrey. And he told Bob about me. So Bob Joffrey said, well, tell Finus to, because we were the San Francisco Ballet then. That's when I left the San Francisco. And we were at the Seattle World's Fair. So he said, tell Finus, stay in Seattle. And if I like it, because I'm going to choreograph Aida. And I'll put him in that. So that's what you saw me doing there. I was in Aida. So. Uh, it's 1962, and first of all, um, we moved, we moved, we moved, um, and I shared a part with Helgi Thomason, who is to, today the director of the San Francisco Ballet, excuse me, and uh, we stayed in Jamie DeBolt's apartment. <laughs> Everything is full circle here. Uh, Bob Joffrey Studio then at the time was on 6th Avenue, uh, maybe between 9th and 10th, I can't remember, a long block but anyway you know it was one of the famous studios and to this day it looks the same i was there a couple of years ago the stairs are still creaky you know um and they're very narrow uh studio they were then okay so uh when we got there um it was summer it was summer right very hot in new york and in Bob Joffrey Studios, the sun would just come blazing in. So it was really, really like working in an oven. But one of the interesting things is that one of the first days I went there, I saw this 
Oh, I mean, she was an old, but you know, I guess middle aged by then, kind of stocky in a blonde leotard. And she was um, standing in front of the mirror, balanced, you know, in a pirouette position, could it be a and she was gripping her butt, you know, and poking her fingers into her glutes on half toe. And I said, what is she doing? Yeah, first of all, I never saw, you know, a woman that age because we were always working with professionals, right? Younger people. And it turns out she was Lillian Moore, who was actually quite a famous writer and ballet de Maine. And uh, she helped Eric Broom write his book on Bourneville technique, which actually you should get. It's very interesting. So it's interesting too, because today, what is it? 54, 56 years later, maybe. I teach pirouettes like that. Um, I grip, you know, I, I grab, put my finger around my glutes here and I tell you, and I squeeze and I said, push them in and your hips are forward. And I said, I want you to lock your hips. Lock your hips so they don't wiggle or wobble or tilt on you because they are the center of your body. And from there, you must learn to make a plie, all right, a preparation from which you're going to pirouette. And that is um, in his book, <clears throat> Eric Broom, whom I met a couple of years later, he says, when you're making a pirouette in fourth position, the force should come from a good preparation. The most important words. I mean, do I ever say that? The word preparation. So he says, with the legs, buttocks, and back firmly held. Yeah. And isn't that what I teach you? The um, preparatory plie that if you grip the floor and pull with your toes and start to pull your body down, all the muscles up your leg from your toes to your hip are engaged. So your muscles are firm right? You're tight. You're tight. So you're not going to fall apart. So he says, anyway, uh, with equal strength in the supporting and the working foot during push-off. And do I say that? How many times I say that in class? I say, all your toes huh, have to push the floor at the same time. I want you to be over your the foot you're going to turn on, because usually I teach the long fourth position, which looks much nicer, the balancing style. But nonetheless, you have to push the floor with all your toes at the same time. All right. Then he says, now I'm going to put it all together. The force should come from a good preparation with the legs, buttocks, and back firmly held with equal strength in the supporting and the working foot during push-off and from the snapping movement of the head. He doesn't even talk about the arms here. Isn't, so isn't that interesting? Because that's what I try to explain sometimes. That That's why if you grip the floor, right, and you're number one, and you're standing over your supporting toe, then you should feel a connection from the floor, from your toe, up to the leg, up to the center of the body, to your eyes, right? And my mantra is always what? Hips forward, toes grip, eyes spot. Hips, toes, eyes. I mean, how many times have I said that, right? Well, I'm only following, you know, what one of the greatest dancers of the world said. And it's in his book. You can read it, right? So I don't make these things up, you know. Whatever I teach, I teach you what I've learned from the great dancers in the world. So anyway, we go after uh, being in New York. Um, we are going to be sponsored by Rebecca Harkness King. Let me just show you. This is, and she's a very handsome woman. This is Rebecca Harkness uh, in her apartment. She is a lady, right, who paid for everything. Um, she was a wealthy widow of William Hale Harkness, Standard Oil. So that tells you it might be. And then she is now married to Dr. Benjamin H. King. And he always used to have a cigar and he say, karma, he called it karma, uh, which is a Buddhist word too. Um, anyway, she brings us up to Watch Hill, Rhode Island, where she has her summer home called Holiday House. 
and it's up in the hill. It's huge, right? I'll show you a picture of that later. So here we are to hold a uh, summer workshop. We're getting ready because she's planning to send us on a tour. So uh, we dance this. One thing to note that, sorry, sorry guys, um, the, the YouTube camera, just for, because it's a little bit different, it takes a longer to adjust. Check this, check this monitor when you do it, because it's perfect on Instagram. When you show a picture, it just, it goes too fast, something I just noticed. Oh, so you, Jason's you'll see. just saying that, you know, I'm, I'm doing this to Instagram, but you're looking, some of you on YouTube, so you're delayed, a little bit delayed, okay? So I have to wait a little bit more. Yeah. So send us your comments. Also, comments, you know, write your comments, okay? I want to know what you think, and what you're learning, all right? So anyway, here we are, you know, as ragtag poor dancers at this exclusive um, resort, which is all built around the Yacht Harbor, you know, um, and she's up there on the hill. And of course, um, we are going to take class and rehearse. She has, there's an old firehouse, which of course she bought and she renovated and built a beautiful studio on the ground floor <clears throat> and the top floor. And right next to it is the um, Bay Breeze uh, apartments, a uh, wooden building, but we're all housed there. So, you know, you get up in the morning and whatever, and you put on your ballet and you just walk across the yard, or the bricks, rather, the gravel road, and right into the studio. No subway, no bus. Also up there, no, no fire engines, no traffic, no people yelling or screaming or fighting. So it was amazing, you know? So we're in this very contained atmosphere. And here, you see... Okay, there's um, Donald Sadler, Robert Joffrey, and Alvin Ailey. Bob is 32 years old and um, undertaking his first project with this artist. He is, his company have been traveling by station right around the world. Uh, Donald Sadler is 44 years old and he had been well-known dancer. <clears throat> Uh, he had danced in movie musicals and with, with American Ballet Theater, in Broadway shows, and he's a two-time Tony winner. So he is to choreograph a ballet called Dreams of Glory, uh, which is about John Kennedy, about a boy who dreams he becomes president. Unfortunately, this was really one of the most torturous experiences because Donald was so sweet and so kind but he really couldn't figure out what we should do. So we're standing there, you know, falling asleep on our feet, waiting for him to come up with ideas. And it took forever. And of course, you know, it's done to Rebecca Harkis's music. So that tells you something. So we wore the most glorious costumes, full sets, and it was done three times. And then it was put in the warehouse. Didn't work, didn't work. Alvin Ailey is 31 years old and he's danced on Broadway in House of Flowers in Jamaica. And we got to see his company. And I have to tell you, I mean, he was the most beautiful man you have ever seen on stage. I mean, his way of moving such, he was so muscular, you know, and he could, and when you look at pictures of the Ailey, you go back to Ailey Extension, you look at those photos of him. I mean, his body could bend, you know, he, he danced from the spine, right? But anyway, he also danced with this wonderful, I think one of the probably the most beautiful woman who ever danced on stage, Carmen the Lava Lot. And the two of them danced together. But this was really eye-opening because I'd never seen a black company. Right? And of course, at that time, they did Revelations. It's the first time I saw Revelations. 1962. You see how long? And isn't it funny? Full circle. Because today, I'm teaching at the Ailey Extension, which came about because of Alvin and his success with his company. Right? So then they, they had this building, this wonderful studio. Studios. Okay. So, um, so we saw Revelations, Hermit Songs, and Blue Suite. 
And we thought, oh my gosh, what is he going to do with us? You know? Um, so what happened is, um, I'm going to show you who some of the dancers were. So this dancer, you, can you see that woman in the air? That is the fabulous Elizabeth Carroll, the most perfect technique in the world. She could turn. Look, look, at, look at her hips. Look at her hips. And can you see me? I'm back there. Okay, and who's that behind you? That's Nels Jorgensen. And over there is Helgi Thomason. And behind Nels here is Marlene Rizzo, who later became Helgi's wife. And we always were partnered together. We were the gigglers, all right? We always giggled when we danced, okay? So, but this is Elizabeth Carroll. Well, I'll tell you about her. Uh, anyway, um, so we were three hours away from New York City, okay? We could take the train. And um, on weekends, Mrs. Harkness would invite us up to swim in her pool at Holiday House or go down to the beach. Um, we can't shop at the Village Butcher because it's so expensive, right? So we would go into Westerly, which was a town, and do our shopping once a week, you know, get all our food, do our booze, and also um, do our laundry. And that was the movie theater. And we just go and see whatever movie there was. Um, but it's funny, you know, we were 20 dancers. And this is 1962. So most everybody smoked. And we drank like crazy, you know, in the morning, you go behind, the, you know, our apartment building, uh, the, where we stayed. The trash cans are just overflowing with bottles of wine and booze. And we drank. We drank so hard, but we worked hard. Okay. So, but it's really funny that. All right. So here, this shows you, this is the firehouse. Okay. And that's Robert Joffrey giving class. And I can't identify everybody here. I think I'm back there somewhere. Okay. And then here I am with um, Janet Mitchell. And we're doing, the, of course, we did a Korean dance. I wonder why, because I was the Oriental. Um, and we're wearing the Korean robe and we're in the pot of shop. So this, um, what you're seeing is we did a, a showing at the Fashion Institute in practice clothes. And you know, we all wore the uniform, as you can see, right? Everybody's in uniform, right? You have to be in uniform, okay, like that. Nothing else, okay? You couldn't dress the way people dress in class today. No, 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 okay? So one of the things that actually started to irritate us eventually was that Bob never thought we were good enough to dance in New York. So that was always kind of like an itching point, you know, for us. You know, here we are working hard. I mean, we did dance at the Delacorte Theater in Central Park, um, and that was it in New York. And then we did a showing. And of course, it was an invited showing uh, where we got reviewed. And that's where we did, and actually what Alvin did, we did Dreams of Glory, as you can see. But here we are in Alvin's first ballet. This is the first time he did a, a, a work for a ballet company called Feast of Ashes. And this is me in there. And of course, you know, I was still kind of pulled up from Madame Periuslavic. So you see, like this is Larry Rhodes down there. But you see I'm bending his back. I mean, Larry could do everything. You see how low he is, grounded? So I know Bob Joffrey would always tell me, you're too light, you're too light, you're too light. And I didn't know what that meant. Of course, I was walking on half toe all the time, you know, <laughs> still pulling up. Um, so anyway, this Feast of Ashes turned out to be a very successful ballet, which we did everywhere. And in fact, it was taken into the, the Ailey Company. And you might have seen it. You might have seen it. I think it's a wonderful piece. And it was choreographed um, to the music of Carlos Surinac. And we had never heard music or dance music and or work with someone like Alvin. And he would try, you know, all these crazy lifts. I mean, like, can, can you just put your arm and, and can you let the girl hang on you there like a trapeze? And then can you walk on stage with a girl 
standing on your shoulder in ponche and make a procession like that. I mean, he tried all these things. I think we did it actually like that. Um, you know, so Alvin was in dancer's heaven, you know, because we were just, okay, whatever you want. And so, you know, he would, the best thing for us is we did the, um, the tavern dance, uh, which was later on in the ballet where we have to, uh, you know, um, harass the leading girl. And so we, you know, spray up her hair and dirty up her face. And, and then we'd walk onto the stage, you know, slouching you know, like that with a cigarette hanging from the mouth. And then we did this wonderful, you know, dot, 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 you know, male dance, okay? Which was so great. It was so much fun to be evil, you know? That was the first time we got to do things like that. Um, so I say here, Venom has never tasted better. Then uh, Fernand Nault, um, who was the director then of the American Ballet Theater School, and actually a Canadian, he choreographed the ballet. And actually, he later choreographed the hip uh, rock ballet, Tommy, okay? Um, so he made a ballet for four women and four men. So there we are. This is starting with me here, all right? And then there's Larry Rhodes and Richard Webber and Helgi Thomason. See us in the air? And here we are. Look, at one time I did an arabesque. Can you see that, everybody? That's me in arabesque. I mean, you're never going to see it today. <laughs> you know the first thing you lose when you stop dancing? is your arabesque, okay? Especially because I've worked in an office and all those muscles. That's what happens when you sit, right? You, you can't lift your leg behind. You can't arch your back. So anyway, I, at one time I did have an arabesque, all right? So, so you have to get the book just to know. Yes, I did an arabesque. I know what that feels like. So. Bob, of course, has assembled a wonderful group of dancers. Some of them who had worked with him before, okay? Nels, Bruno Ruiz, um, and I'm gonna mention other people. But Larry Rhodes is our company's male virtuoso. And remember, I, I told you, I didn't tell you? Yeah, I first saw him in 1959 when the Ballet Russe danced at the University of Utah. And he was this kid, you know, before the show, doing double tour to the knee, double tour to the knee. And then 59, right? So here we are, 1962. We're in the same company. And he was so funny because he could do so many pirouettes. So then he'd do pirouette, but he'd do pirouette, and then he'd do fuete attitude, and then you do. And he'd just keep turning, you know, twirling like this, you know, in attitude. I, I never saw that before. So, and Larry could bend his back. Like, I mean, he could do everything. He could jump. He could, and that's why he was a great dancer, you know, because his body was so expressive. And unfortunately, you know, we lost him. And he actually, Larry and I became very close friends. And then a year ago, actually, he had a heart attack. and He died, but he had directed a Julia. But we used to go to... Um, to shows, you know, like two old ladies, you know, we go every Saturday afternoon to a matinee and then we go and have dinner. So we did that for about two years or three years. We became theater buddies. So it's just so funny. You see how, <coughs> excuse me, everything is full circle, right? I mean, it just never stops. The connection, it just keeps repeating all the time. Uh, Elizabeth Carroll is our female virtuoso. She had studied with Marika Bessabrasova in uh, Monte Carlo. And later I took a class from her as well. There's nothing she can't do. She had been with ABT. Her form is perfect, perfectly turned out. Beautiful feet, turn, balance, jump, jump. I mean, she could jump. So it was something to work with people like that, you know, with Larry and Lisa setting the bar for everybody in our company. Can you do what they do, all right? But then there was a very special person, Lona Isaacson. And um, actually, here she is. Here we are in India, India. And she's just sitting on the floor. That's Lona, the fluffy, and that's, I'm there. And this is Larry Rhodes, okay? But this is what we look like in La Fille Mal Garde, 
in India. But Lona, she's always smoking. You know, she's Danish, Danish, okay? But um, every time, uh, you know, we had a break, she'd sit and she'd cross and she'd start, you know, kneading her muscles, you know? And I'd never seen anybody, you know, dancers. We didn't do that, you know? we. You did class, you did rehearsal, you went on stage. I mean, there wasn't any of this kind of therapeutic thinking that we have today. And she would just keep, you know, endlessly, you know, smoking and then, you know, working on. But you know something? She changed the shape of her legs. So finally, when we danced, uh, and actually, you can see it. I think I put it up on Facebook. We did zealous variations. That's where I do a double tour, double tour. Then I do double to right, double to left, just to show you then that I did. And you'll notice that I spot very quickly. But she was the most extraordinary dancer. And when she and Larry danced, because they went through Harkness Ballet, I mean, they made you cry. I mean, you've never seen dancers like that who could be so expressive with their bodies and as dramatic dancers. You know, and when she would walk on stage, I mean, I stood in the wings. I mean, you just start crying. She had that power, you know, just with her look and her eyes. So I got to dance with her, and um, we'll come back to it later when we get to Harkness Ballet. But the thing is, is that she, at that time, Galina Ulanova was the great Russian dancer. And, and the Russian always wore these chiffon things, you know, with skirts. And um, Solona just adored it. And she could, you know, dance like Ulanova. So I remember uh, we were right by the water. So we went out there and, uh, and she's dancing and she's singing. She always sang. And I had the most beautiful footage of this, this extraordinary dancer. I mean, like Gelsie Kirkland. She was like pre-Gelsie Kirkland, okay? So like floating on air, all right? So like, like an angel on earth. And later what happened when I quit dancing, I burned it because I destroyed my past. And there went blown up in flames and I should have kept that. I, I burned Eric Boone too. Um, anyway, that's later on, that's later on. But um, this is also where we did Brian McDonald, a Canadian, okay? And this is actually a picture from the Harkness Ballet because I don't have the Joffrey doing it. But just to show you, you see what we did? So it was a very sensual ballet, you know, um, which the, um, the critic, she says, um, when we did the ballet in Central Park, she said, it's an orgy, of predatory sex, mercilessly animated by animal appetite. It drew a sharp performance with the Joffrey troupe, usually more noted for its genteel classicism than its grasp of earthier dancing. And anyway, Brian was a Canadian and taught, he became director of the Harkness Ballet and choreographed the wonderful piece. He's the one who choreographed my double first. And he would always say, gentlemen, is it possible for you, and then we do, he would start doing all this guy, one, two, three, four, five, what we would call them the fives, these step, which we had never done before, you know. And the music was really, you know, very powerful, Paul Creston. So it was called Time Out of Mind. And it became one of the signature works for Joffrey and the Harkness. Um, Arthur Bloomfield of the San Francisco Carl Bolton wrote, Phew, we're out of breath and very much in a good mood. Have just seen the Robert Joffrey Ballet Company toss a very large and exhilarating afternoon of ballet. It started with a compound dose of sexual trauma in perpetual motion called time out of mind. And at the end, he says, um, but soon all this, and we did, stomping, jerking, breast beating. The women came out on stage like this. And they pranced around the stage like this. And then later we had to do what we call the bicycle lift, where the women are like a la seconde, and we're holding them up. So the woman against your, your chest with her legs open in second, and we're like, you know, driving them around the stage. So we call that the bicycle. And when we did it in Central Park, 
I was partnering Karina Rieger. And when we went off, I hit her head against the post. Luckily, she was not seriously injured. Um, see, I was never a good partner. Anyway, so we did that. So December 1962, we embarked on our first international tour sponsored by the State Department and the Rebecca Harkness Foundation. We will dance in Portugal, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Iran, Afghanistan, and India. So Mrs. Harkness sends us all to Saks Fifth Avenue, and she says, buy what you need, buy what you need. So we all, <clears throat> the men bought suits, the women bought you know, suits as well, dresses. So we could visit the, the heads of these countries at the receptions and a uh, winter coat. So we all bought clothes we could never afford, afford to buy our own. This is why these years were really amazing. From 1962 to 1969, Mrs. Harkness paid for everything. So because it was Mrs. Harkness, we stayed in five-star hotels, you know? We stayed where she stayed. We ate where she ate, you know? It was quite extraordinary. You know, that's why I had the best of times, really. Um, so um, in the, my repertory would be Sweet Feast of Ashes, Pastoral, Incubus, Paradis. Then I have a famous Paradis story. Paradis was choreographed by um, George Balanchine. It's actually from the full-length ballet Ramonda. But it's one of the famous um, show pieces because it's only it's five dancers, a lead couple, and four men and four women. And here again, by this time also, uh, my double to a trauma, you know, what was over? It was pretty much over um, because working with Bob Joffrey, um, one of the reassuring things is that's where I first met Paul Sutherland, and Paul would stand in fifth position like this, and I went, "Wow." That's different. You can't stand like that in San Francisco Ballet. You can't stand like that in Madame Perry's Lovers class, right? But he was like that, you know? So I said, okay, I'm not gonna get uptight about fifth position. So that allowed me to start finding my, my old body and my old technique. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so there were two casts of Paradis, right? So here we are at the firehouse in Much Hill. And so Bob runs the first cast, you know, and we're all, because we're not supposed to dance that day. It's not, it's not our rehearsal, it's theirs. So we're all sitting on the floor and watching, right, for about an hour. Then all of a sudden Bob says, okay, let's see the second cast. So we all go, what? I mean, we didn't say what, but we've been sitting on the floor, you know? So you're like stone cold and we have to do yum, yum, yum. Thump, thump. Yeah, and we have to do double tour, you know, double tour, double, each in a row, like that, okay? I mean, what expression can I use beyond shock? But he could have at least said, you know, you guys, you know, keep warmed up because I want to look at you later. But see, Bob never did. And that was one of the funny things about Bob. He kind of had this little, you know, he could get at you in a way. And... Um, I would say it was his, the first hint of his indifference to our needs, which is eventually why we left the company. So, and then Bob always wanted everything full out. So rehearsing few manga, you know, we're doing the right dance, right? You know, so I'm doing it because I mean, that, like in San Francisco, Lou never expected anything from us, you know, facial. He just said, you know, you go on stage, you perform. You don't have to perform for me. But Bob Joffrey wanted so he, he would say, smile, you almost smile. So Vicentina Breda, who was wonderful, you know, John Moyni, remember? And he called Marlene, Marilena, and I was funny, right? Anyway, so Vicente showed me what Bob wanted me to do. He wanted me to go, as you rake the leaves and you shake your head like, wow, you know, wow. Have you ever raked leaves like that? Anyway, Bob was happy. Bob was happy, okay? So that was, again, one of the other, <clears throat> I don't know if you call it a strain, but it was really, in a sense, learning to perform, though, too, wasn't it, right? Okay, so it was a big step for me from San Francisco where, you know, Lou was 
like that to Bob Joffrey, who was like this, and Jerry Arpino, you know, who was like this, you know. So anyway, so 1962-63, we first went to Lisbon, <clears throat> when it's strikingly beautiful, you know, the, they have the blue and white mosaic tile sidewalks. And each night after the show, you eat late, excuse me, I have to, <clears throat> we would go and eat, what, 11 o'clock at night? Okay, everything is late there, right? Uh, and listen to Fado, which is these beautiful women, the voices. Uh, it's like singing Portuguese blues. It was so wonderful. I mean, again, you know, a totally new experience for me. Then after Lisbon, we went to Beirut. And we actually went to Beirut several times because they had a big casino. And so beautiful, you know, on the water. And of course, we stayed in the Phoenicia, which is long gone, you know, poor Beirut. Um, and then we went on to Amandra. And I should tell you that we didn't dance for the public, you know. We danced for the, um, the government. So for the government people, the head of the country, and their... I guess big business people. <clears throat> um, they were, it's all white, you know, not ethnic, not the people who actually live there. <clears throat> so um, we're doing Pastoral, which is a quiet ballet, and it was a very small stage. And I got a little nervous because it was dark, but it was small enough so I could control it. I did my double tours, no more trauma. Um, and here we are in Amman, Jordan, and that is. Uh, King Hussein, this very young emperor, All right? And here we are below, here we are in the old city of Jerusalem. You know, let me see, what am I doing here? Is that better for Facebook? Yeah, that's better. So I know you can't see everybody. So, you know, you get the Kindle version of this book, which is $9.99, which may be too much for some of you, but you can see it on your, your PC, okay? So I read all my books on my PC or on iPad, or also on my iPhone, right? But on the PC, you can blow up the pictures as big as you want, all right? So this is not what you'll think. So anyway, um, of course, our performances are highly praised because Rebecca Harkness, you know, some kind of, you know, we're sponsored by the State Department. Um, but then we went to Jerusalem and Bethlehem, and I could just not imagine, I said, my gosh, this is where Jesus was born. And never, you know, when I was a kid in Hawaii and looking in my Viewmaster, you know, slides, would I ever imagine that I would actually be there in Bethlehem and Jerusalem? You know, I, so that's why these years were such great reward. You know, I mean, really beyond my wildest dreams, okay? Um, after... Jerusalem, we went to Damascus, Syria. And if you have never taken a cab ride by a driver from Damascus, zooming up the down the hills, I mean, they were daredevil drivers. So scary, you know, so fast, you know. That's why I, I would have told George Bush, I said, don't fool around with these people, you know, because they are very strong. They are very, they're fighters. They're very tough, you know. So after Damascus, we go to Tehran, Iran. And we dance for the Shah of Iran, that, that Shah, the famous Shah, right? Uh, and then we visit Isfahan, uh, where we saw these children weaving the rugs. And I still have it in my hallway. And I, I see that every day. And I'm always reminded. 1963 in Iran, Isfahan, where the children made these beautiful, beautiful rugs. And of course, they eventually go blind, you know, because they're working right almost in the dark. Um, so then we're in Kabul, Afghanistan. And it's up in the mountains. It's cold winter, winter, snow. But the street, you know, has uh, stores along the side, and they're all open. They're all open. And, you know, in these countries, everybody offers you chai, tea. You go and have tea, you know, and they talk to you. Um, and 
Of course, in Afghanistan, so make, they make those beautiful red, you know, Afghan carpets. So you see these guys, you know, carrying stacks of rolled carpets coming down from the mountain to the marketplace, right? It's the first time I saw an Asian face with orange hair. So all along the way, you know, surprises, surprises, you know, a, a new world, a new culture, right? So then we go to India for seven weeks. And while in New Delhi, you take that is the Taj Mahal, which was another one of my, you know, when I was a child looking in the Viewmaster, right? Never, ever thinking I would go there. See, again, you know, all my childhood dreams came true. So strange, right? And then, of course, um, behind the, the Taj Mahal is, is the river, where you see lots of trash floating by. And sometimes there are apparently were bodies, because people would be buried in the water as well. So in India, we went to Hyderabad, Ahmedabad, Madras, which is now called Chennai, Calcutta, which is now Kolkata, and Bombay, now Mumbai. So no matter the city, there are throngs of people to walk through. And the children, little children, come up to you and they say, patting their stomach, they say, no mama, no papa, baby hungry. No mama, no papa, baby hungry. And then they would follow us to the bus, you know, baby hungry, baby hungry, you know. So it was so saddening to see people, you know, living in that poverty like that. So we lived through it. Uh, we have actually a funny story because after that, Vicente and a few of us, we went on to Hong Kong. Actually, from there, I actually, I actually went to Korea to visit my father. So when we're in Hong Kong, you know, they have a, they tell you at night, you turn off the, the water because it's water shortage, right? So of course we had gone out, you know, gotten drunk. And so we're sleeping and the next morning, bang, 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 you know, on our door. And we step out of bed. The floor is full of hot water. We didn't know to turn off the tap, right? So the water was running and the whole room was flooded with hot water. Anyway, we escaped, we got out of it. We also had clothes made in Hong Kong. That's what you did then. So, so summer 1963, we're back at Watch Hill to prepare again. And um, here's where we may first met Madame Volkova from the Danish Ballet and Stanley Williams, the famous Stanley Williams, right? This is his first trip. And um, Stanley, you know, didn't speak much, but, uh, he loved Helgi Thomason. He loved, I mean, he couldn't take his eyes off Helgi. And so he'd come up to, at the bar, right? And he'd kind of look at me and he'd put his hand on his hip and he'd go, you know, and I interpreted that as he doesn't like me. Then I figured out, he must mean I should push my hip forward, get my hip up higher which is, of course, what I teach today. How many times do I say the word hip? But he looked at me and went, you know, and then usually when we did center floor, he'd look at us and he'd go, and then he, when Helgi danced, you know, he was so happy. But the rest of us were just, <laughs> anyway, I lived through that too, okay? So I got back at Stanley though, because we invited him to dinner because we were sharing an apartment with Helgi. And I made my Korean beef, which is with chili peppers, right? So Stanley was all excited to try this. And the first mouthful, he went, oh! he couldn't believe how hot it was, right? So I, I mean, I did do it maliciously, but that's the way we ate then. You know, we all cooked, you know, and I made fried rice with Rebecca Hawkins. She loved my fried rice. So anyway, in October and December, we went to the White House to dance for President Kennedy and his guest, Haile Selassie, the emperor, the emperor of Ethiopia. So afterwards, we got to shake hands, the hand of JFK, 
you know, and 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 Jack. I mean, this was, you know, this at this time, this was Camelot, you know, JFK, uh, the later going to the moon. I mean, you know, so in December, right, 1963, we're in Russia, and um, we open at the um, then it was called what was it called? Today it's the Marinsky. It was a Marinsky. They changed the name of it. Anyway, we were there. Pavlova and Nijinsky had danced, and, and Balanchine studied. We danced um, Leningrad, Kiev, Donetsk, Kharkov, and it's so funny. They had a parade in Donetsk. We were the only people watching the Robert Joffrey Ballet. Everybody else was in the parade. <laughs> At that time, also, you know, when we stay in the hotels, too, shh, you know, because they're speakers, they're listening to us up there. Um, anyway, while we were in Kiev, okay, President Kennedy was assassinated. Can you imagine we're in Russia, in Kiev, and we learned that JFK is dead? I mean, we were just because, you know, we, we loved him, you know? And the Russian people would come up to us, you know, crying. And they would, you know, touch us, you know, like say, we understand, you know, we feel so bad too. So isn't this amazing? I mean, we didn't speak the same language, but they really respected JFK, John Kennedy, right? So by then, Bob, turned his teaching duties over to Richard Thomas, who gave what we call calf cramping classes because he was very much in the Balanchine style. So Bob started to get distant, you know, at this time. So before his show, he's wandering backstage and he's picking lint off the curtain. And then he would come up to you and, and just, pick lint off of you. And in Russia, <clears throat> and Bob would sit in the front row. And he's in the front row with opera glasses, binoculars. And sitting next to him is James Howell's assistant. And Bob keeps going. And Jim's taking, then he comes back. And in one of the dances we did, um, I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, Martin, Martin and I, again, right, we're wearing feathers. And, you know, also you have to understand something. When Richard Thomas gave his class at 9 o'clock in the morning, freezing in the theater, I mean, all he did was just tighten up our muscles. So it was so painful, right, that we weren't really as warmed up as we should be. So Martin, Martin and I, you know, were saying, oh, my knee hurts, you know. Bob saw that, and he comes and he says, and Finus, he says, why are you talking to Marlene? You know, and then he, anyway, he, he says, you're all ugly. You're all ugly, you know? Can you imagine? So that is why, finally, at the end of it, right, um, we tell Jean Alcheroni, our company manager, we say, we don't know what's wrong, but we can't, we can't work with Bob anymore. And um, so when we came back from Russia, we were sent on an eight week bus tour. And most of you don't even know what I'm talking about, right? Of 55 American cities, okay? Here we are exhausted, tired, you know, from and missing eating our American food in Russia and being told we're all ugly. So luckily, Richard Thomas's wife was Barbara Fallis. She taught us and she was beautiful. She did everything on Demi Point without the bar. So sweet. She was like our mother. Thank God for her. Okay. So anyway, I want to tell you um, that there was light because after this, Rebecca Harkness responded to our needs and she said, I'm going to make my own company. Those of you who want, come along with me. So she did not steal us, which is the wrong story everybody gives out, okay? She did not, we left Bob, okay? 
we left Bob. And so that is why Rebecca Harkis made her company. And I want to show you this book. I know you can't, but this is Marie Paquette. And I want you to get this book. It says Ballet to the Core. Okay. You get it on Amazon because Marie was in the company. Well, that's with Joffrey. And she is such a great writer. And she had a great experience with ABT and the Joffrey. So you want to know what New York was like in the 60s and the 50s, ABT, Joffrey, all of that. It's called Ballet to the Core. And Marie often, um, see how pretty she is? Marie Nesson, she often writes haikus for me on the website. So this is ends the Joffrey period, okay? I hope you enjoy the session. If you would like to pay for class, please do. Go to finestjohn.com slash live. Your comments are always welcome here on YouTube and on Facebook. On Instagram, it's really hard to, to read these. So if you have something you really want to say, email me, okay? Find us at finestjohn.com because I really want to know what you think, all right? Um, all, if you're on YouTube now, go right now. You see all my free videos, okay? Become a subscriber. All my instructional videos are now selling at half price. Streaming videos only at finestjung.com. DVDs only on Amazon. All right? Tomorrow we will do your favorite age defined therapeutic stretches. Um, this is translated because someone wrote, she said, I don't speak English, not a word. But the language of dance is universal. And so I read your body like reading a book. Thank you, Mr. Finus. What you do is wonderful. With affection, Helena. Wherever you are, Helena, thank you, okay? So if you enjoyed reminiscing with me, please, you know, get this book, Ballet to the Core, all right? Because I keep telling you to read something, so you might as well read and learn, okay? So you have to grow your mind, okay? Remember I keep talking about that? Don't feel sorry for yourself. I know a lot of you hardship, all right? But get into your mind. Make your mind bigger. Make your mind bigger than any of the problems you face, all right? That's the whole thing. We have to grow our life, all right? So the problems become smaller. And you'd be surprised what can happen from reading a book. Something you never thought of will come into your mind and your life, and you will eventually overcome all these difficulties, okay? But I... Tell you again, we must be very careful. We are responsible for ourselves because really nobody's looking out for us. You have to know that, all right? We have to look out for ourselves and protect ourselves and protect each other. So let's try to treat each other with respect. I see people still on the street, not wearing masks, you know, go blah, 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 you know. They don't care. I mean, because basically we're a very uneducated country. You know that, right? Because too much TV watching, all right? So get off that TV, get off your butt, get up, move, and work your brain, all right? So I'll see you tomorrow. Have a good day. Just for a day, our king and queen would visit all the islands and saw everything. How would they feel about the changes of our land? Could you just imagine if they were around and saw my ways on this sacred ground? How would they feel about this modern city life? Tears will come from each other's hands and they will stop to realize that our people are in great danger mind. How people, how would they feel? Would they smile? Be content?